thank you. And um, I'll begin by recognizing, as I did at the beginning of this series, that it, when you actually think about the, say, the political situation, not just here, but in Europe and all across the world, we are living in a very dramatic time of evolutionary change. And I think of it really in those terms. Um, not all of the transitions that take place in life or the transitions that take place in the evolution of a civilization are smooth, are continuous. They are much more come in jumps and pulses. And I'm going to try to illustrate that by, first of all, just looking at the parallel between an individual human life, which also moves in stages. We're not just continuously starting a little bit of puberty and then we have a little more and a little more. No, it, it happens at a certain stage when the body and the rest of the nervous system is developed and is ready to make that move. And then it moves rather quickly. So if we look at the uh, individual human, I'm going to use that as an analogy for the movement that takes place through our species as homo sapiens, as the human species that we are the members of and for which there are no other members of the former versions of Homo. There were numerous versions, that, the last ones being the Neanderthals, that are no longer present, they're extinct. So if you look at just a normal human life, there's birth, there's growth, and there's death. And I'm going to refine that and go a little more deeply, but I want you to think of the fact that if we look at our species as a whole, it emerged um, maybe something like 10 million years ago. It grows and it probably will have an extinction because all most of the things that have ever come forward are extinct. Now that doesn't mean there won't be any humanoid-like creatures around. In fact, there's good evidence to believe that there's a kind of evolution of Homo sapiens. There are fingers of evolving thrusts. They may not be successful, they may not happen, but we, there, as there's evidence of movement that wants to, wants to keep changing the species. So let's go back and look at the human individual in a little more detail. So there's birth, and then there's the infant toddler stage. And then there's the teen stage and adult. And we can fill that picture in a little bit more. Birth, then the, one of the important things that happens at a particular strategic time in an infant is the appearance of teeth. And then the next important thing is walking. And then as we go on in age, there's language. And then when you get to the teen stage, there is puberty and sexual maturity. And then in the adult stage, there's reproduction. Now I've simplified this, but those are pretty, those are pretty much the major stages. So with that in mind, I've, I'd like to now use that an, as an analogy for our species as a whole. So, what I'm now thinking about is our species as a whole, which I could have written here Homo sapiens, which I'm thinking of as humanity. And we emerged about 10 million years ago from apes and chimps. And here we are as Homo sapiens, and this is our lifeline. So the first stage is the hunter-gatherer stage, which a lot of animal species also partake of. But about 10,000 years ago, agriculture was invented, if you like, uh, and came into being, especially along important river valleys. 
And then there was an important age that developed that was related to the development of the social system of human beings and the intellectual and cognitive system of human beings that's called the Axial Age, about 800 to 300 BC. And we have what we're living in, in the wake of, is the scientific age and the enlightenment, which is from the 17th century to the present. And we can also see that important things happened here, such as the, the worldwide trade, uh, the development of religion and writing, and they're actually kind of important together because you know how important holy books are. Religion relies very much on the holy book, and you can't do that unless you have uh, monks or sages or religious priests who can write and read. And then at the top of the list here is science. Uh, and I'm sort of looking at the possibility of new species coming out at some time in our future. Now, I thought it was kind of interesting to think about the conflict of science and religion, which is very much a part of the modern world, um, as having a little bit of similarity to the upsetness the emotional disturbance and the need that you have to bring to puberty. Kids going through puberty have to kind of pull themselves together and it's, it's, it's often a very difficult and painful time, but most people get through it and it has, it's, it's a stage that you have to go through. But it's not as though it's smooth and not, and not without uh, some troubles. And I was thinking, well, what the sexual maturity sort of triggered off, it's triggered off by hormones. And those hormones are created by regulatory genes that when the body has reached a certain stage, it says it's time, it's time to become sexually mature. And these hormones are sent out and the body responds and does, does its thing. It's actually kind of a beautiful and amazing thing the way that happens. But what I was thinking of is people often talk about sex hormones as kind of being a kind of disturbing thing, which, which they are. But I was thinking about science here, which has come at the end of this string as being a little bit like maturity, scientific maturity is a little bit like sexual maturity and science is like these hormones that have been released into the cultural system been released into our newspapers and television and understanding, common understanding. Now, most people still don't know how to do science. Most people still are not scientists. Uh, so it's still a new thing. And especially at the level of understanding evolution and the neurology of the brain and how our emotional system works, these are very rapidly advancing frontiers of science at the present time. And I think they're up, they can be upsetting and disturbing because we don't quite know what to make with them because our usual anchor points in the past have been much more religious anchor points where you hold on to. And the scientific hormones, if you want to think of them that way, uh, disrupt that equilibrium in the same way when you were a child your equilibrium gets disrupted by the onset of puberty and the transition through it to an appropriate adult stage. Okay, so I now want to try to say something about the kind of pre-scientific understanding of God. And that pre-scientific understanding of God was strongly a God-man understanding. That is, that God is very much, first of all, first and foremost, concerned with human beings. And second, is himself a kind of big human being. So 
Uh, this wonderful work in the Sistine Chapel of God here and Adam here and that almost touch of the fingers but not quite touching, a kind of electricity flowing out of God into Adam, giving him life, creating him. But the thing I'd like you to notice is that this God is, in fact, a man. Now, we have enough sense to say, well, that's not really what the artist meant. He, he, he doesn't mean that he's really a man. But there's a lot of ambiguity about that because the God-man that is typical of Christianity and Islam and Judaism is fundamental to the social organization of human beings. It's fundamental to bringing people to want to love their neighbor, not uh, covet their neighbor's wife, uh, be fair in transactions and not cheat. Uh, all of the moral codes are strongly rooted and maintained by religion. So it's very much about people and their relationships. And it's important because we're the most social species on the planet. We can't live without one another. You can't, if, if I was to take you away and put you in a nice, very comfortable place where you could have plenty of food, plenty of comfort, no problem of cold or anything else, but you could not know another human being and you could not communicate and you could not send messages and you couldn't listen to the radio, all of that was cut off. All there was was the rest of the natural world and you. You would perish, you'd go crazy. And it's true of an ant. If you take an ant out of the colony and put it in an environment where it has plenty of, of food, it will die. And that's true of human beings. So it's non-trivial how to hold the sociality, the social behavior of human beings. And in fact, it's our biggest problem. Look at politics, there you are. It's the biggest problem we have is how to how to share the social benefits that individuals create, how do we share them? It's not easy. It's a very complicated problem. And often it's accomplished by, in our previous ancestors, you shared among your tribal members and you stole from your other tribes. You went out and raided them and took from them. And that was perfectly moral because you took care of your kinsmen. Okay, so I just wanted to show you a picture of Shiva, who is the Hindu god of kind of the top god, the god of gods of Hinduism, and just uh, mention that the, the god-man is not unique to Judeo-Christianity and Islam. Uh, the, actually in Islam, the man part is played by the prophet Muhammad. So Allah, who inspires Muhammad, it's like God the Father and God the Son. So the, the conveyor of God's information is human. So in the case of Hinduism, they're all balled up into one. Shiva is, he has got many, many arms. He's got all of these artifacts that show his power. He has an elephant that he rides and can control. And elephants are not easy to control. Uh, he has the, the snake, which is dangerous and which he can live with and find a compatible relationship with. He has this special drum which can play two, two, two tones at once. So <coughs> he's got a necklace of skulls because he's the master of life and death as well. So all of the properties of God are blended with and 
manifested in this human representation. It's a kind of interesting way of doing it. So it's not just that you, Christianity has a God-man and Okay, so what I'd like to talk now is about God beyond and more than a spirit in the collective mind of human culture. Because there's no doubt about that, that God is a spirit in the collective mind of both individuals and the collective mind of human culture. Now, uh, a scientific type person might say, well, but does God really exist? Well, that existence as a spirit is powerful. It moves mountains. It gets people to die for the faith. It gets um, infidels to be crushed and so on. So that spirit is non-trivial. And to say, well, it's just a spirit. It's just a imaginary, somebody's imagination. You don't understand the sociology of humanity, if that's your position. But still one can ask, as somebody did one of my last lectures, I don't think it was Patty, but it was, uh, well, but does God really exist outside the mind? And I think that's a reasonable question. I'm not gonna try to answer it today, but I'm gonna try to shed some insight on what might go into, into it. So, First of all, the universe is a lot bigger than human beings. There's a lot more to the universe than humanity. And there is in the universe a creative element in the atoms and molecules and their quantum fields. Now this is perhaps something that is not familiar to most people. But we all, as human beings, tend to assign that if we see something complicated or if we see something that's not like a tree or a bird, we think somebody had to make it. And we might even think that somebody had to make birds. Somebody had to make trees. You can't have complexity without making. Now this is a really big and important mystery. But I think what I'd like you to understand is that there are four fundamental self-fields in nature. There's the electromagnetic field, which is actually the field that's responsible for bonding atoms and electrons and protons. In fact, it's the fundamental field that's very important for chemistry and the periodic table of all the elements, all of the things that are pretty much in this room are bonded together and held together by the electromagnetic force. And it has the capacity to do that. Uh, you see it very simply with your magnets on your refrigerator. They don't need you to push them and hold them to the refrigerator. They can do it themselves. And at a much deeper level, atoms and molecules have a way of bonding together and creating structures. And the overarching field that is tied in with the electrical force field is the quantum field. It's like the spirit, if you like, the spirit that's in there. It's not the actual atoms themselves. It's the instruction that determines where they should be. And where, how that instruction gets established is by the forces that push and pull and put the atoms into a certain configuration. Now, we as human beings in, our, in laboratories can get in there and manipulate those atoms and make them do what we want. But long before human beings were on the scene, they were doing what comes naturally to them, which came in the environment in which they found themselves and what was the result of their interacting, creating new quantum fields, which created new positions for the atoms to be in, and was in fact new creation. 
So the self-creation is a very important aspect of the universe. You don't need an external agent. And therefore, the word that I think is more appropriate if you're going to try to find divine presence in the universe, and I think it's, it's, a, it's worth using the word divine, although I, it's a kind of overused word, but there's something really quite transcendent and spectacular about what I'm talking about. Uh, so, imminent gets the idea that that divinity, if we want to think of it that way, is in the matter itself. It's in that quantum wave function. Don't look for it outside in the way that you may be making things outside. It's in the matter. And one of the things it can do is create animals and human beings and so forth, which then can make new animals. And, well, we don't make new animals very well. I remember somebody who said, I don't see how you could possibly believe in evolution. And I said, well, make me a cat. And he said, well, you know, that's pretty hard. And I said, well, you know, it takes about four billion years to make a cat. That's about how long it takes because it has to be done very slowly, step by step, with evolution. Now, the thing that's the kind of main subject I wanted to talk about to you today uh, is what I think is a very natural impulse. It may not be with everybody, but I think it's, it's pretty fundamental. It's the impulse to reach out and touch the source of the creation and one's own existence. I don't know if this has happened to you, or maybe in the quiet of your room, or away from the din, but I don't know if you've ever had the impulse to want to, as Annie Dillard said, say hello. Say hello to the source of your existence. Um, and that's what I want to talk about for the rest of this lecture, is that impulse. And that falls under the category of prayer. Now, I'm not thinking of prayer the way children are taught to pray or prayers that they should be saying or all the prayers and prayer books. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not, I don't include that, but I'm talking about something much bigger than that. I'm talking about the impulse to touch your source of existence, even if it doesn't touch back or you don't hear from it or don't, just that impulse as a finite creature to want to say hello. So I'm going to talk about some of those, um, ability, those, those impulses and what they're like. Uh, and I thought I'd show you something visual. This, uh, the work of this artist, Carlos Schwabe, has a certain appeal to me. And it's, you know, it's quite fantastic, but this is a painting of his called The Virgin of the Lilies. And what I like about this is that it captures the kind of creamy, lovely wonder of, the, of cumulus clouds and the way the atmosphere can be at that time. And you can see down below is the, are the roads and the fields and the clouds below. And of course, growing in the clouds are lilies and walking along is the virgin and child. Now, this is obviously quite imaginative. Virgins and children don't walk in clouds. But it's trying to capture something else, something else about the wonder and beauty of the clouds and its resonance with things that are important to us, like women and children. And um, I think of Carlos Schwab making that painting as praying. He offered a prayer. Now, this is something that I think you've probably all seen. This is a very famous painting by the Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh. It's called, it's entitled Starry Night. 
and you can say, well, no sky looks like that. It doesn't look like that at all. But the artist is trying to penetrate deep, more deeply into not only the object that we see, the sky and the stars, but its meaning to us, its connection with other things that we live for, its relationship, first of all, to a small little village, and also its dynamism. It's like beyond us. It's so wild, enormously wild stars. And uh, this dead tree stump. All really great artistic inspiration gifts that this man had. And if you read the writings of Vincent van Gogh, you see he's quite a troubled individual in many ways, but he's very clear and lucid that he's looking for God, that that's what he's doing. And when he writes to his brother, who is all concerned about him and the fact that he's always out of money and he's barely able to keep a roof over his head, it's clear that that doesn't mean that much to him. And he's, you almost want to say um, to his brother, Cleo, but Cleo, you're missing something that he's trying to tell you. Maybe you don't have a hole in your heart, so you don't need to fill it. But he's got perhaps a hole in his heart that he's looking for the way to fill it. The way to, he's on a quest. So those are some visual uh, prayers. So on this issue of the God of imminence, that is a God that is not standing outside touching things and making them happen, but a God that is built into the natural world. Uh, I'd like to try to use a river metaphor. Like a river of stars. These are stars that are in the outer regions of, a, of obviously what was a supernova explosion at some point earlier in the evolution. And they're like the rivers that you can see in maps or photographs taken from a high elevation of countries. With Google Maps, you can easily do that now. And even have some relationship to other kinds of networks that were the flow of fluids is important to the life, like the veins in your body and your arms. So there's a kind of unity of these rivers that are not just rivers of water, but rivers of life. This is the Milky Way looking edge on. We, we live in this galaxy, which is actually a kind of a flat pancake of spiraling stars. So the river of stars in our galaxy is spiraling around. And when you look up and you see the Milky Way, you're seeing it kind of edge on. Um, so there's another river of stars. And then there are rivers and brooks and streams that are all kind of magnificent in their own small ways. And so this idea that I'm trying to suggest to you of a God that is imminent in creation, which I think captured very well in a poem of Robert Frost, which I'd like to read to you now. Uh, let me set the stage. Uh, the poem is a dialogue between a man and a woman. They're married, rather newly married, and they're out in the woods near their home, and 
the woman speaks first. Fred, where is North? North? North is there, my love. The brook runs west. Well, rest running brook, then call it. West running brook, men call it to this day. What does it think it's doing running west when all the other country brooks flow east to reach the ocean? It must be the brook can trust itself to go by contraries the way you and I the way I can go with you and you with me. Because we're, I don't know what we are. What are we? Young or new? We must be something. We've said we too. Let's change that to we three. As you and I are married to each other, We'll both be married to the brook. We'll build our bridge across it. And the bridge shall be our arm thrown over it, asleep beside it. Look, look, it's waving to us with a wave to let us know it hears me. <clears throat> Why, my dear, that wave's been standing off this jut of shore the black stream catching on a sunken rock, flung backward on itself in one white wave, and the white water rode the black forever, not gaining, not losing like a bird, white feathers from the struggle of whose breast flecked the dark stream and flecked the darker pool below the point where at last driven wrinkled in a white scarf against the far shore ald alders, that wave's been standing off this jut of shore ever since rivers, I was going to say, were made in heaven. It wasn't waved to us. Well, it wasn't, yet it was. If not to you, it was to me in an annunciation. Oh, if you take off to Ladyland, as it were the country of the Amazons, we men must see you to the confines and leave you there, ourselves forbid to enter. It is your brook, I have no more to say. Yes, you have too. Go on, you thought of something. Speaking of contraries, see how the brook in that white wave runs counter to itself. It is from that in water we were from. Long, long before we were from any creature. Here we in our impatience of the steps get back to the beginning of beginnings. The stream of everything that runs away. Some say existence like a pirouette and a pirouette forever in one place stands still and dances, but it runs away. It seriously, sadly runs away to fill the abyss's void with emptiness. It flows beside us in this water brook, but it flows over us, it flows between us, to separate us for a panic moment. It flows, it is time, strength, tone, light, life, and love, and even, even substance, even substance lapsing unsubstantial. The universal cataract of death that spins to nothingness and unresisted, save by some strange resistance in itself, not just a swerving, but a throwing back, as if regret were in it and were sacred, 
so that the fall of most of it is always rising a little, sending up a little. Our life runs down in sending up the clock. The brook runs down in sending up our life. The sun runs down in sending up the brook. And there is something sending up the sun. It is this backward motion against the source, against the stream, the most we see ourselves in. The tribute of the current to the source. It is from this in nature we are from. It is most us. Today will be the day you said so. No, today will be the day you said the brook was called West Running Brook. Today will be the day of what we both said. It's a love poem. It's a prayer. Um, some of you may have come to some of my earlier lectures when I spoke of a young woman who, was, uh, who died in the Holocaust, but before she died she had written several journals and they were saved and her journals contained some very lovely prayers that I'd like to read to you. These are prayers of Etty Hillison. And I, I'm, I might say something about uh, praying yourselves. I don't, that, and that's a kind of private affair. And there's a way in which um, prayer is a little bit like lovemaking. It's, it's done in, not done in the public square. Uh, it's for the bridal chamber. Um, but I do want to encourage you that if you do have any kind of sense of wanting to speak, be free to speak even as a child in the privacy of your own heart, out in the open on a dark night with a brilliant star above. It's possible to say something as intimate as, I love you and speak to the source of your creation. Um, so, these are prayers of Eddie Hillison, and we can take them as kind of, well, they're first of all very interesting in their own right, but she can be a kind of teacher or a model because she speaks honestly to the source of her creation. And I should say that when she began these journals, she was a very secular woman, which is fine, uh, because she had a spirit and an impulse. She was not a religious person. So she begins by talking, now by this time, the Nazis had taken over Amsterdam, so she was, they were living under occupation. The jasmine behind my house has been completely ruined by the rains and storms of the last few days. Its white blossoms are floating about in muddy black pools in the low garage roof. But somewhere inside me, the jasmine continues to blossom undisturbed, just as profusely and delicately as ever it did. And it spreads round the house in me in which you dwell. Oh God, you can see I look after you. I bring you not only my tears and my forebodings on this stormy gray Sunday morning, I even bring you scented jasmine. And I shall bring you the flowers I shall meet on my way. And truly there are many of those. I shall try to make you at home always. Even I should, if I should be locked up in a narrow cell 
and a cloud should drift past my small barred window, then I shall bring you that cloud, O God, while there is still strength in me to do so. I shall try to help you, God. You cannot help us. We must help you. And it is all that we can manage these days, and all that is in all that really matters, that we safeguard that little piece of you, God, in ourselves. I think this brings out what to me is another important aspect of the eminence of God in the creation, which is the eminent God is inviting, not powerful. He's not a big man who can throw thunderbolts around. Quite to the contrary, the God that is imminent in the creation is more like all the possibilities that can be and an invitation to be one of them. The God of imminence is inviting. It's more like a baby, uh, not God Almighty. Um, So here's another prayer of Eddie. God, I try to look things straight in the face, even the worst crimes, and to discover the small, naked human being amidst the monstrous wreckage caused by man's senseless deeds. I try to face up to your world, God, not to escape from the reality into a beautiful dream, though I believe beautiful dreams can exist beside the most horrible reality. And I continue to praise your creation, God, despite everything. I think that's another remarkable prayer of Eddie's um, that speaks to the discouragement that some people could get into, that the world is just a terrible place and it doesn't have anything redeeming in it. These are not unreasonable impulses to feel, but there's plenty to say, and even if it's not plentiful, there are moments to say, this is beautiful, this is good, whether it's those stars, or whether it's the jasmine, or whether it's just this prayer of this woman who was executed in a gas chamber. Praise the creation no matter. I think that's, that's the prayer. Now here's a prayer that's more about intimacy with God. Take me by your hand. I shall follow you dutifully and not resist too much. I shall evade none of the tempests that life has in store for me. I shall try to face all as best I can, but now and then grant me a short respite. I shall never again assume in my innocence that any peace that comes my way will be eternal. I shall accept all the inevitable tumult and struggle. And to be able to pray that prayer is a really quite special grace. At the same time, you pray that prayer about the jasmine. Somewhere inside me, the jasmine continues to blossom undisturbed, just as profusely and delicately as ever it did. It spreads its scent around the house in which you dwell, O oh God. You have made me so rich, O oh God. Please let me share out your beauty with open hands. My life has become an uninterrupted dialogue with you. O oh God, it's one great dialogue. Sometimes I stand in some corner of the concentration camp, my feet planted on your earth, my eyes raised toward your heaven, Tears sometimes run down my face, tears of deep emotion and gratitude. 
At night, too, when I lie in my bed and rest in you, O God, tears of gratitude run down my face, and those tears are my prayer. I always end up with just one single word, God, and that says everything, and there is no need for anything more. Actually, that's a good place for that phrase, uh, for the word God. There is nothing to say and everything to say. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, that's where we're going to stop.